Well, good afternoon or morning, wherever you're joining us from today. I am Nathan Oli, and I'm here to welcome you to the Road Session Virtual Exchange focused on investing in infrastructure, rural strategies for building and maintaining healthy local economies. I'm the CEO of the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, one of today's five partners bringing this session to you today. We're bringing the session in partnership with the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, the Community Strategies Group as a part of the Aspen Institute, Rural LISC, and the Housing Assistance Council. And for us, it's really an opportunity to bring really unique conversations with a very rural and tribal perspective to the work that we're doing and the work that we're collectively doing. A couple of quick housekeeping pieces before we get started with the great conversation we have planned for you today. Uh, first of all, why are we doing these? Uh, the five groups that came together to pull these together really wanted to make sure we could highlight and unpack rural development ideas and strategies that are critical to the response in, from the COVID-19 pandemic. Not only that, we want to feature on the ground practitioners. We want to really get to the core of the issues and the opportunities that exist in rural and tribal areas across the country and highlight unique voices as we do that. We want to make sure that we're spotlighting those assets and the challenges that we're seeing, but also really rise up really important conversations. It's why we're here today talking about infrastructure. Many of you probably know and understand already that a bipartisan policy framework was passed by the Senate just last week and hopefully soon by the House that's going to bring some really historic investment in infrastructure uh, to communities of all sizes across the country, but in particular to rural and tribal areas as well. And finally, we want to strengthen the networking of organizations that are focused on these issues. It's not just an opportunity for us to highlight unique stories, but it's also an opportunity through the, the breakout sessions that we'll do afterwards to help people connect with one another and learn from one another in a really unique fashion. So what are we going to be doing today? So we're going to have a panel discussion today from three to four. Uh, we've got a great host of speakers that we're going to be bringing to you, both uh, from across the country, but also with really unique perspectives on diff different infrastructure. And then from 4 to 4.45, we'll have breakout rooms. It's a chance for you to meet one another, to ask questions, to really get to know others that are focused on these issues, and really dive a little bit deeper into some of the areas that are highlighted by our speakers today. One thing uh, for everyone to notice, there's a chat box and a Q&A box, two separate pieces to this platform. In the chat box, please feel free to share who you are, where you're from, um, any insights or things that really stand out in the conversation. And the Q&A box is your opportunity to ask questions of the speakers. So throughout the, the time here, the first 45 minutes of the session, you're going to be hearing a couple of different conversations with our speakers. At the end, the last 10 to 15 minutes, we will leave space for questions that have come up through the, the Q&A box. So if you have questions for any of the speakers or any of the topics that you hear covered today, please feel free to put them into the Q&A box below. Also, we love it if you could share any insights that you have, both on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever social media channels you have. You see the five organizations that are partnered on this and some hashtags for that. So please be engaging not just here in the chat, but also on social media as well. And finally, before we dig in, the breakout sessions at the end of today. You should have received an email with a special Zoom link for the breakout session already. If you haven't, please reach out to csg.program at aspeninstitute.org, and they will make sure that you get an invite to that today. The recordings of the first hour will be available uh, on our webpage within the next few days, and we'll make sure to send it out to the full registration list. But we're really excited to have so many people with us today. We had a thousand people register for this webinar, and so we're excited about not only the topic and the speakers that we have, but also all the individuals that are going to be participating with us, both here live, but also on social media as well. So to get the conversation started, we always try and have a little bit of a perspective on, on data and research and why the topics we're covering today are so important. And we're really, really lucky to have with us today Emily Feenstra, who's the Managing Director of Government Relations and Infrastructure Initiatives for the American Society of Civil Engineers. Emily is going to share a ton of, of research that they've done. They do an annual report card every year. And so she's going to touch a little bit on the infrastructure that we see today and also obviously some of the opportunities that might result as, as a result of, of what we've seen at Bottom Hill and obviously the report card that they put out. So Emily, I will pass the baton to you. Thank you, Nathan. And thanks to the Aspen Institute for having me here today. Um, so yes, a little bit first about the American Society of Civil Engineers. Um, we are a membership organization of 150,000 civil engineers working in your communities across the country. I love seeing people saying where they're from across the country. So we've got engineers working on drinking water systems and ports and transit. 
um, the electric grid, roads, bridges, you name it. And part of ASC's mission actually is to protect public health, safety, and welfare. So about uh, 20 years ago in 1998, we started producing uh, an infrastructure report card once every four years. And it was to kind of raise awareness and highlight some of these things that are out of sight, out of mind problems for most Americans. So the drinking water pipes below your feet, uh, the bridges you drive over every day, um, again, the electric grid, some of these hidden assets. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes it takes a crisis for that to be put to the forefront. And over those 20 years, we've kind of seen infrastructure gradually creep into the mainstream conversation, become more of a national priority. And, and so it's an exciting time to be having this conversation with you all, given the federal discussion happening right now. Next slide. So, oh, go back one, sorry, to the grades. So we put together this report card. Um, we have a committee of about 32 civil engineers that come together from public sector, private, and academia um, to look over federal data um, where available to you know, analyze all of these 17 categories according to criteria from public safety to innovation to resilience, uh, current condition and capacity, and to come up with these grades. And it's a <clears throat> report card, just like you take home or your kids would bring home from school. And as you can see, the latest version in 2021, um, the grades aren't great. We have a C minus overall for our nation's infrastructure. And I'm sure some of this rings true for you um, where you are when you see some of these Cs and Ds, but, um, we were not quite celebrating a C minus, but I'll note that it is uh, the highest grade we've given on an overall report card since we started doing this. You can see the green arrows where the grades went up a little bit uh, to get us to that C minus. Yet, you know, I'm a parent, I would not be thrilled with that grade, and there's still 11 grades out of 17 stuck in the D range. So, just to highlight a few for you and, and talk about some of the impacts that we see. Uh, particularly in rural communities. And of course, all of this is, comes back to public safety, it's quality of life issues, it's, it's economic growth. Um, but, you know, we have bridges was the one grade that actually went down in 2021 to a C. Um, we are making progress across the country on the number of structurally deficient bridges, yet at the same time, they're still 7.5% of our nation's bridges that are structurally deficient. And we know for rural communities that has an outsized impact. For example, in the state of Mississippi, we saw in 2018 that there were about 500 bridges that had to be closed um, due to inadequate maintenance. And, and that had impact on local agriculture. You had uh, huge, lengthy, costly detours to get goods to market. You had emergency vehicles and school buses um, that couldn't get where they need to go when some of these bridges in rural areas were not in good working order. Of course, more often than that, you see things like bridges posted uh, with weight restrictions. So the biggest trucks can't go on them, for example, or a school bus might not be able to travel across that bridge if we know it's reached a certain condition, a poor condition. Other categories here, uh, dams was a D once again. Um, we have an increasing number of high hazard dams in this country. And those aren't necessarily in the poorest condition, but they're high risk, meaning um, a failure or a breach could cause uh, loss of life or heavy, heavy property damage. And that's happening as a lot of these bridge uh, dams that were in rural areas, perhaps protecting a farm, now there's downstream development of those dams uh, and increasing encroaching development in those areas. So now we have a higher number of high hazard dams. Another area just to flag for you, transit was our lowest grade in the 2021 report card, D minus. And there's about 45% of Americans that still lack access to transit in their communities. Um, and I'm sure many of you uh, see this play out in your own communities. And so we do see a heavy emphasis on improving access to transit, improving funding for transit in some of these recent federal infrastructure proposals. 
Um, and finally, maybe I'll flag stormwater. Stormwater was our new category in 2021. It debuted at a disappointing D. <laughs> um, so stormwater, um, as again, we see increased um, development, kind of more opportunity for runoff and flooding. Uh, really, a lot of communities are grappling with how to get a handle on stormwater. Do they come up with their own utility to address stormwater? Uh, what to do with this kind of routine flooding. See some of that on the next slide. So we know that um, rural communities face some unique needs when it comes to infrastructure and might not have access to all of the funding opportunities, especially um, when we're talking about federal legislation. So, um, I'll talk a little bit about this at the end, but I think there's been strides made in increasing opportunities for rural communities to access some of those federal funds to think about some of the impacts that are unique to rural communities and rural infrastructure um, and to come up with tailored programs and technical assistance. But one area that ASCE has been particularly vocal on is the need for better asset management, whether it's a small drinking water system um, a small transit agency, what have you. Um, and one of the, the programs that we liked was in the state of Indiana. They came up with a local technical assistance program um, to help trans transportation agencies, local agencies do a better job with as asset management, um, tap into some of the software that's available that a lot of uh, more urban areas are using and, and come up with a better system. And I think moving forward, um, this is an area, you know, I know RCAP has done a lot of work as well to get a sense of the inventory of what you have in your infrastructure system, get better data to track the condition that it's in. And hopefully um, there's an opportunity um, to help prioritize where some of those funding needs are and tap into some of those grant programs. Um, when you can point to good data about the condition of your assets, the plan for updating and modernizing them. So that's something we've seen across the infrastructure sector. We actually did a policy report, just lessons learned from other sectors when it comes to asset management. For example, we found that the utility industry and, and uh, some of our energy and electric grid partners had uh, some lessons learned on asset management that they've been implementing for decades that perhaps could translate to other sectors. Next slide. The other news that comes out of our report card, in addition to the grades, which are always uh, popular in news reports, is our investment needs. So again, using federal data where we can, we come up with um, the total estimated needs across these 17 categories, what we think will be spent based on existing trends, and then what that shortfall is. And so even though the grade edged up over four years ago, we did see an increase in the funding gap as well. It has inched up to 2.59 trillion across the 17 categories over a 10 year period. It's important to note, um, we don't expect the federal government to uh, completely fill that gap, um, but uh, we do see you know, in the trends of state and locals that are increasing the funding um, for their infrastructure assets while federal funding has remained stagnant up until this point. Another thing to point out is just when you look at the total gap, about half of it is due to surface transportation categories. So that's your roads, bridges, and transit systems. Um, a large part of that overall investment. And last slide. And um, of course, just want to mention, you know, the moment we're in, I'm sure you've read some of the news reports on you know, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the infrastructure proposal that was passed by the Senate last week and has been a priority of the Biden administration. Um, it's a bipartisan plan. It would be 550 billion in new funding um, for most of those categories that you see in the report. Um, it is you know, not a perfect proposal, <laughs> um, but I think we consider it really a huge down payment and definitely kind of historic investment across a lot of these categories, a lot of good policy changes um, and opportunities to build more resiliently 
um, to take advantage of new uh, designs, materials, et cetera, um, and some hopefully new programs to target some of that funding to disadvantaged communities as well. So a little bit of a highlight of what we're looking at there and the moves to the house for consideration. Well, thank you very much, Emily. This was really fascinating and an important discussion to lead into conversations about what is actually happening on the ground around infrastructure. I, in particular, love the chart on funded needs and what is not yet funded, because I think that's an important part of the conversation of understanding not just, okay, we've got these grades on our infrastructure and we need improvements, but here's what it actually is going to take to do it, and here's what's funded currently in the gap that we need to, to actually fill. Uh, and it actually leads perfectly into our next conversation. Um, we've got a really unique perspective to be brought next uh, by Dave Castillo. Dave is the Chief Executive Officer of Native Community Capital, uh, a great partner, um, but also doing some really incredible work, um, both in, with, in Indigenous communities across the country and, and certainly around that capital access piece. And so, Dave, I will hand it to you and then probably have a couple questions for you when you finish. Yeah, okay. Appreciate it. Um, hi, everybody. And um, my own name again, Dave Castillo from Native Community Capital. We're a native CFI. We are headquartered in Laguna Pueblo in New Mexico. If you don't know where that's at, it's okay. A lot of people don't. But our new uh, Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, is from that tribe. So she kind of put us on the map, and, and hopefully you'll, you'll uh, look that up. I know a lot of the folks that are on this call today are not from tribal communities, uh, but you, your constituency or uh, your service territory may include tribes. So I hope these comments will be useful. Um, also kind of want to note that uh, I think a lot of the, uh, the commentary that the speakers have today overlap, whether you're a tribal community or, or, or not. Um, so with that, um, just want to, I guess I'll start by saying the first 25 years of my career have been spent uh, studying and addressing access to private sector capital for tribal communities. Um, and first slide, please, or next slide. If you're not familiar with Indian country or tribal issues, um, these are just some of the, the titles that have been in my uh, uh, reading list over the years. The one on the far left there, uh, it's the first book that one of my uh, uh, supervisors gave me when I first started working back in right after college in, in you know, 1997. And uh, I'd, I'd had a lot of book knowledge, a lot of theory on organizational design and, um, and, and you know, uh, theory and, and, and other matters, but, you know, it's, it's doing the work where you really learn uh, what's needed and, and how to go about it. So uh, that was the first, one of the first titles. And the one on the right there, uh, 25 years into my career, had opportunity to uh, submit a chapter and, and have it published in, um, in that book that was edited by uh, some folks at uh, ASU and U of A. So just a few titles to kind of keep in mind if uh, you want to bone up on uh, tribal issues, if again, if they're part of your constituency or in your service territory. Uh, but what I'll tell you is that uh, for most of my 25 year career, I was that guy uh, banging my fist on the table, demanding the public sector, private sector and nonprofit intermediaries do more to address the needs of Indian country. Uh, I knew like any of us working on these issues that the economic justice arguments were on our side, but justice is hard fought, not given. During my policy days, tribal leadership would reference how after World War II, Europe was offered the Marshall Plan because the United States valued the contributions that European nations could make to the global economy as allies. And so it was critical to get those economies back online after the war. However, Indian nations never got their Marshall Plan after the Indian Wars. Instead, poverty programs were offered with a much different intent. So it's been a little bit of a shock to my system um, that the resources we've needed for so long are finally flowing. The American Rescue Plan and pending infrastructure bill represent the largest single one-time investment into tribal communities that we will likely ever see. In essence, our Marshall Plan. Uh, the American Rescue Plan is at around 20 billion for tribal nations, and the infrastructure bill is estimated uh, at approximately 12 billion. So significant. Uh, next slide, please. And yet, uh, so here's here's just one illustration of where our starting point is at, right? Uh, not unlike a lot of other rural communities, um, but in many cases, tribes are literally and figuratively 
stuck in the mud due to a lack of not only physical infrastructure, but administrative infrastructure and capacity as well. The biggest challenge to using this windfall of capital will be deploying it efficiently. And so we cannot let what was happened with, for example, the 184 loan guarantee program happen to these new funds. Um, that graph in the middle there isn't real clear, but uh, the point is, I think, uh, that red line shows that money intended for folks in reservation communities has been flowing consistently to urban areas for 25 years, leaving those living on tribal lands stuck without access to capital intended for them. And it need not be that way. Um, another comment that was made by my colleagues is that the US can put a man on the moon and more recently land a rover on Mars, but it can't figure out how to make mortgages on tribal trust lands or broadband access or rural health clinics or public safety programs, take your pick. So we know it's not a technical problem to build roads, broadband infrastructure for housing and community development. It's one of political will. Uh, next slide, I think. Okay, yeah. So it's one of political will and the relationships necessary to do the analysis, structure the transactions, build the projects, comply with investor requirements, maintain the projects and grow new opportunities. It's complex. Uh, there is no silver bullet. There's only the work. And there are many moving parts as illustrated by our friends here from the Enterprise Community Partners in their Tribal Leaders Handbook on this very subject. The biggest issue in my view is a severe lack of precedent. In the past, investors, in my experience, right, 25 years of this, um, investors, contractors, specialists would say, you know what, there isn't enough economic incentive, there isn't enough deal flow to justify an investment of time to develop a tribal practice or to serve tribes or even if they're in our service territory. One statement that's uh, etched in my mind was made by a banker uh, after the passage of Nahasda, which was a watershed piece of legislation having to do with Indian housing. And this was back in 1997 uh, when I started my career. And uh, this, this statement has haunted me ever since. Uh, he asked me, and, and very sincerely at that, uh, he said, why, why should he go through the brain damage of doing a deal in Indian country when he could get what he needed from the office of the comptroller of the currency, that is his, his regulator, um, by doing a deal with, with blacks or Hispanics, right? Serving East LA, Southside Chicago, as opposed to reservations. And so, what we see here is that the profit motive has been a hindrance. Good news, however, uh, this $30 billion of new money uh, has a way of capturing the interest of what could be new partners uh, in the effort, um, including the organizations uh, in a virtual room today. Uh, so if you haven't been engaged with tribes in the past, understand there is a great need. And I think partnerships and relationships are one of them. Uh, better yet, um, you know, for those na native organizations or native social enterprises in the virtual room today, uh, the creation of new native owned and controlled enterprises uh, could be significant here. And even better yet, some combination and enduring partnerships from both groups to secure the contracts to get the work done of rebuilding Indian communities with these new stimulus funds. I think the next slide is on my last slide. Next slide, please. Um, so where have we seen success? Uh, there is some good precedent. Uh, remember, most tribes uh, are almost entirely dependent on federal grant dollars. However, this tribe shows how those grant funds have been used to leverage other sources of capital. In other words, incentivize the participation of private sector investors. Uh, the, the infrastructure and homes built here uh, are, are beautiful. Um, you know, nothing elaborate, but well done, well made. However, the beauty part uh, from a tribal administrator's point of view or an investor's point of view is that this project was so well put together that five different organizations agreed to commit funds to realize the project. 
Um, I don't know about you, but it's, it's hard enough to get five of my colleagues to decide where to go to lunch on any given day, much less five bureaucracies to put almost $3 million of their money for a small tribe uh, in, in Northern New Mexico, which is where this was at. Um, you know, again, at the end of the day, coordinating schedules, addressing the concerns of tribal council members, managing the expectations of tribal members, uh, educating uh, that underwriter that you might be working with or agency head, uh, that the tribe has a good and improving track record of using its federal funds as intended, uh, hammering out legal agreements with the lawyers, they're always involved, of course, um, convincing a private lender that if anything goes wrong, it will be made whole. All of this involves people and relationships absolutely critical to establishing the precedent that we need. And that can help launch Indian country into a next era of what I like to call tribal social and economic resurgence. Uh, my message to tribal leaders, uh, time is of the essence. Uh, pick your projects wisely, confer and execute the details with your trusted advisors, and, and absolutely do not give one penny of these stimulus funds back to the federal government. Use it all. My message to would-be partners, investors, public agency administrators, and industry practitioners, my message is this. Make a significant investment of time and resources to build your capacity to work in Indian country. Uh, yes, there will be some brain damage. Uh, we'll offer you plenty of strong coffee and aspirin, uh, but, but let's get this done. Let's see what we can build together. So thank you very much, and I'll look forward to the uh, discussion afterwards. Dave, thank you very much. That presentation was phenomenal, and your statement about being the single largest investment in the tribal communities potentially of, of our lifetime or others' lifetimes is incredible. And so I've got some questions I've already generated uh, that your conversation has prompted and look forward to those at the end of today's, today's discussion. So thank you for being with us. Thanks. Next, I wanna bring up and pivot. We've gone from Emily to the high picture and Dave to talking about some of the specific issues in tribal communities. And now I wanna have two different conversations uh, with some really fantastic on the ground practitioners, folks that are doing this work every single day in rural and tribal areas. The first of which is Alexander Brandon. Alexander comes to us from Communities Unlimited where he's the Environmental Services Area Director. So Alexander, uh, I'll invite you to come on screen. I've got a couple questions for you, but looking forward to, to the conversation. First of all, uh, welcome, but thank you again for being with us. Can you talk a little bit about where in the country you work and some of the communities that you're working with right now? Certainly. Um, so I'm located in central Mississippi, right outside of the state capital. Um, my home is actually in Ridgeland. The work uh, that we do here at Communities Unlimited as a partner with RCAP um, revolves in our seven state region. Again, I'm in Mississippi, but we operate in seven states, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, and then we jump across the river and pick up Louisiana and Arkansas, Texas and Oklahoma, and we certainly can't forget Tennessee. Um, and most of the communities that I work in and the staff that we have here in our state, um, those are communities that are usually very small um, populations in most cases with the work that we do are populations 10,000 and less. Um, actually feet on the ground. We spend a lot of time in communities that may be 1,500 or less. Um, so a lot of the work we do here in Mississippi is in the Delta region, but we do do a lot of work throughout the state as well. So Alexander, you mentioned that you're close to Jackson. Obviously Jackson's been in the news uh, for some of the infrastructure uh, issues that they've had. Can you talk a little bit about your own perspective, especially from the small community perspective, those kind of 1,500 to 3,300 in populations on how the impact of deferred maintenance and other issues have, have really an impact, especially on the water and wastewater side of, of the ledger? Sure. Um, they are not that different from the city of Jackson in regards to the infrastructure issues. Um, I think back on some of the project work we've done in the past year and the years before working with those communities that applied for CDBG funding, where there was water and particularly on the wastewater side um, to go in and do assessments in those communities and find sewer systems that are still operating, um, clay lines, um, uh, sewer systems that are operating with brick lines. Uh, so, uh, and for a city the size of Jackson, you would not think that was the case, but they've got some of the same similar problems there in the city of Jackson. So, um, 
quite the same um, same story amongst those two. I think where we what we start to see the problem is most of those systems were developed and put in place 40 or 50 years ago, maybe even longer than that. And the communities, for whatever reason, um, have not had all the resources necessary to put into improving those systems. Uh, so they have gone by the wayside a little bit. Um, some of that may be locally as, as far as the leadership goes, and then some of that may be um, a lack of investment from the federal government. Um, but nonetheless, those those communities, again, in the small communities that we deal with, they've got to deal with those infrastructure problems as well. Um, and so there has to be, in my opinion, from the leadership in those communities, a focus on improving those systems um, and being proactive in doing so. So I appreciate you bringing that piece up in particular, because we're talking about infrastructure and obviously large scale infrastructure funding that's going to be coming down the pike. But one of the issues we've seen historically in rural and tribal areas is one, an ability to actually access those funds and two, an ability to manage and sustain those funds. How does Communities Limited and certainly you and your teams work directly on the ground, how do you focus on those issues in particular to make sure that the communities that need these funds the most can access them? Sure. Um, so with the work that we do, of course, this is uh, the work that we do with water and wastewater systems. It is technical assistance, uh, no cost technical assistance. I think that is critically important to those small communities because in so many cases, they don't have the capacity um, to handle these problems on their own. So they need a partner. They need someone to join the fight with them to say, hey, let me give you a hand with this and let's see how together we can help address this problem. Um, not only do we go in and provide that technical assistance through um, the work plans that we develop as partners with them, but we rely on our partners, our funding partners as well. One of our good partners in that is USDA. Um, USDA, they provide great capital as far as grant and loan programs to help address those needs. So we try to work with those communities providing that technical assistance and then use that to try to leverage the funding that USDA makes available to them. So let's, let's dive into that partnerships piece a little bit more because partnership is a word that is probably not used enough when we talk about infrastructure because it can't just be one person, one entity, one organization, one community thinking about this. You know, especially in the water wastewater side where you've got approximately 150,000 public water systems across the country, 97% of those cover communities of 10,000 or less. So the preponderance of, of water, water systems in particular hits rural and tribal areas. What's your perspective on, on how do we help address those issues? We've got a number of systems, you've got small communities that oftentimes aren't collaborating, talking to one another. How do you think about the need for more collaboration and partnerships on the ground? Yeah, um, definitely I think there has to be some communications between those systems that find themselves dealing with the larger challenges of infrastructure, uh, we often talk about regionalization amongst the smaller systems. Uh, and I think moving forward, particularly for those smaller systems, that has to be at the forefront of their minds, if for nothing else, to help those systems reduce the day-to-day -day cost of operating those water and wastewater systems. Um, one of the things that's not going to change is from an environmental standpoint, the regulations are going to continue to get stricter and stricter. Um, so often now we deal with hurricanes, tornadoes. We're, we're getting ready for hurricane season now. And if you live in the Gulf Coast region, you, your ears and your eyes kind of perk up this time of the year. Um, but climate change, global warming, these are all things that have played a, they're having a, a greater impact on these systems day to day. Um, so couple that with the already uh, growing expenses of operating a water and wastewater system. And then all of a sudden you got to start thinking about how can we do this differently? Um, because at some point you can only raise rates on your customers so much before you got to say, look, something's got to give. So then we've got to start encouraging our very small systems to consider regionalization, uh, partnering with those community systems close by um, to reduce 
to reduce the cost of operating that system, but then to also compile all their resources to bring to bear on the problems. Well, I appreciate you bringing up uh, disasters. Obviously, it's an increasing, increasing uh, stressor on communities of all sizes across the country, um, but it certainly puts a really particular strain on small systems and, and those especially that have not prepared in many ways for those. And that's not just water waste, water can be any kind of infrastructure. How do you think about the need to help build that capacity and and you know the the vulnerability assessments and other things that are needed before a disaster hits to try and help mitigate some of these these consequences. So we we often deal with systems that for whatever reason haven't taken that into account in the forehand. Uh, so we'll try to prioritize that as part of our technical assistance. Um, Again, similar to regionalization, uh, we try to get the systems that if they haven't developed emergency response plan, they hadn't completed security vulnerability assessments, those kind of things to get those completed. And in doing that, execute mutual aid agreements with those communities or those neighboring water systems so that in the event of an emergency, uh, you got some friends, you got some guys that can help you out a little bit, say, hey, we got a backhoe over here if you need it, or yeah, we can supply you water for a short time. Um, I guess this is August, so four or five months ago, back in February, we were dealing with this very issue. Uh, it's um, the winter storms that affected so many in the nation, you know, we don't get a lot of ice here in Mississippi, but when we do, it's a uh, it's a problem. And um, we've had we had quite a few systems that had to deal with that. Uh, some of them had mutual aid agreements in place. Some of them didn't. So um, working forward with that, we encouraged them to try to develop those mutual aid agreements with those neighboring systems. Uh, and if they need assistance with that, we're there to help them out with it as well. So I know we're running up just about the end of our time, Alexander. I've got one question left, and that is a particular interest in the Delta region and the communities that you're working with. Uh, if you had one or two pieces of, uh, of advice for, or one piece of advice for those communities about how they engage in infrastructure conversations, and one piece of advice for policymakers on how do they better connect with and engage with those communities, what would those be? Um, so working, with the policymakers, uh, definitely reach out to those offices and express your concerns. Um, I don't think it can be said enough. Funding, funding, funding. Uh, we, we've got to get more funding into those communities. Uh, I know at this, with the work that I've been doing for some time with this, grant funding has, that pot has grown gradually smaller. So I hope with this new infrastructure package, that we can see a little bit more grant funding put into it um, to help address those so that the communities don't have to deal with so much long-term debt. Again, and it's on the communities to address that as well, um, understanding that there's only so much grant dollars they can put in and the communities have to understand their obligation as far as long-term debt. And then as far as with partners, uh, again, reaching out to those communities, those neighboring communities around them, but also reaching out to a technical uh, technical assistance providers. We got some great ones with AWWA, RCAP, uh, Rural Water Association. So there are people there to help you or help those systems with the challenges they face and also to try to go and advocate for them as well. Well, thank you very much for, for being with us, Alexander. I'm sure there are a number of questions that have come in, so I hope you'll stay with us to the end here. Um, but thank <laughs> you for being with us. We're gonna travel up now from the Delta up into to rural Pennsylvania and be joined today by Bridget Darbett, uh, who's a project manager for the municipal authority of the borough of Midland. Uh, ironically enough, I'm from an, another Midland, Midland, Michigan. Um, but, but Bridget, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for, thank you for having me. I'm greatly privileged for you inviting me to join this panel. Well, you've got a fantastic perspective to bring with us today. And so first of all, I want, I would love you to tell us just a little bit about uh, Midland, Pennsylvania and, and the surrounding area. Okay. Well, Midland, Pennsylvania is located along the Ohio River, and we are northwest of Pittsburgh, and we are three miles from the Ohio line. And we were a farm in the 1900s, and in 15 short years, we went ahead and became one of the largest industrial parks because 
of the steel making process. And in about 1910, 1920, uh, the Crucible Steel Company came into effect and they were there until 1970. Once 1970 happened, what happened was the technology became obsolete. Many mills started to crop up and they were able to do what the larger mills were able to do. In 1980, the farm or farm, the mill was sold and other uh, companies tried to take it over and they did, but it really, it really didn't catch on the way it had. So what we had found was about the late 19, 1990s, we had a very progressive school superintendent and he and his board decided that they were going to use the internet to go ahead and they opened the uh, Pennsylvania Ch uh, Charter Cyber School. It now has grown to have over 800 employees, 380 of which are based in Midland. And um, they also, in addition to that, since they're so progressive, they've also opened up an arts school. It's called the Lincoln Performing Arts School. And they also are scheduling a, an opening in 2022. It's a trade school. And it not only will teach the basic trades like carpentry and boiler makers and so on, they're also going to teach green education as well. So. Well, that's a fantastic story. And obviously like many other rural and even tribal areas across the country that have kind of in many ways been devastated by the loss of a major industry or manufacturer or, or, or otherwise uh, it's fantastic to hear about the pivot that the community has made. And, and certainly uh I'm sure there have been challenges that have been brought on by the pivot, especially from an infrastructure standpoint. Can you talk yeah. to us a, a little bit about that, that challenge going from a community with one large, uh, with the steel industry to now trying to diversify a little bit and building off your assets? Okay. Well, the big thing is uh, what we had to do is we went back to our budget and what we had created when we first started, there was a line item budget, which shows you everything. I mean, you start to see, what you're spending on chemicals, you see what you're spending on repairs. And it's really helped to go ahead and see this in black and white because now you know, okay, we need to address this issue. On the infrastructure in particular, we had such large lines. I mean, we're talking 24 inch, 48 inch lines. Well, you no longer needed that size capacity, especially to go ahead and take care of like the warehousing that we have coming in and also the, the schools themselves. So we were fortunate in that community development block grant uh, funding had come through. We had some of our own um, uh, money set aside. We started a uh, capital development fund. So we borrowed from that. Um, also, when you go back, like I said, to the budget, one of the things that we found in particular, we looked at our insurances. And we had a policy, a liability policy, we were paying $51,000 for, shopped it around, came in with it for 31,000. So there's your money to go ahead and do some repair work. So as you think about that, and you think about ways to, to cut costs or better you know, streamline and create efficiencies, are there other solutions that you've come across or, or ideas that you've come across that have been really helpful in that, that transition and uh, ensuring that you can both drive down costs, but also increase effectiveness and efficiencies? Yes. As a matter of fact, we have started to go ahead and look at sharing services. Uh, one of the big things that we have talked about doing was, uh, in particular, our water and sewer is a little different situation. We own the sewer plant, but the borough owns the water or the sewer lines and what we've had to do is we've rented the main transmission line uh sewer transmission line from them so that they would have money to go ahead and do line repairs and we also if the main line would happen to break hopefully it won't but if it does then we would also share in that cost and what we've talked about doing we hope to do is since the water and sewer lines are located close to one another in the same ditch, when we are planning repairs, if they have a repair that's in the same area, if we go ahead and we bid the project together, you have one, one mobilization cost, one contractor cost, 
uh, fill. And of course, in our, in our case, the repair of the street because we have brick streets and those are very expensive to do. And one of the other things that we've talked about doing, um, we started talking about plug hugs. And that's one of those little nice little devices that you use to go ahead and clean fire hydrants. And we don't have the skid loader, but a nearby community does. So our uh, chairman of our board was going to go talk to this other community to see if they wanted to go in with us. That way, both communities would benefit. And one of the other things we've done is when you have a nearby community that has um, a water situation that you, they can't get water to their people, we've gone ahead, we've run water lines to them. And it, what we do, though, is we sell them bulk water. So then that community still maintains their own lines. We don't pick up any new debt for having to repair older lines. And they still have some control. So that makes everybody happy. So what you just talked about, Bridget, is such a critical piece of this, but it's not, it's not easy for those conversations to happen. Whether you're talking economic development, whether you're talking water, waste, water, whether you're talking transit, uh, almost any mode of transportation or, or infrastructure project, those conversations can be really difficult, especially at the, the most hyper-local levels. How did you guys approach that? And how did you start those conversations in a way that felt collaborative as opposed to uh, almost competitive or, or trying to, in some ways, you know, there's sometimes a perception that people are trying to take over other, other pieces of infrastructure. It is, it is a difficult situation, but a lot of times you have engineers who talk to other engineers. And sometimes they're the guys who can go in and make the inroads for you. Your own board people can make inroads because they belong to other organizations. They see somebody at you know the Kiwanis or whatever, and they start talking. And I know in the case of our chairman of our board, he's also on the fire department. Well, the fire department, they usually have three other fire departments whenever we have a fire, either in town or somewhere else. So while they're putting out the fire, believe it or not, they talk about infrastructure and, uh, you know, rates and so on. So I've got two more questions for you, and then, and then we'll wrap up to some questions for the audience. First of which is, you're talking about water sewer in particular, and that is often an unseen piece of infrastructure, right? No one sees it until the water comes out of their tap or comes out of, their, out of the sink. How do you think we can do a better job of helping to showcase and highlight infrastructure like water, waste, water, and others that are a little more invisible and make sure they're more prominently discussed? That's a, that's a really good question because, uh, you know, we've always said it's not the glamorous uh, grant that people, people say, oh, I'm putting up a building. You know, you can see how involved we are in your community versus, well, you know, guys, trust us down here. We have, you know, we spent millions of dollars to go ahead and bring you good water and sewer service. Um, I think it's just going to be a matter of getting the word out in the community and so that they understand what kind of a commitment that someone has made to that infrastructure, whether it's, you know, uh, in our case, it might be a pen vest or, uh, you know, USDA or, uh, you know, uh, if community development block grant, uh, we also have uh, the organization Pennsylvania Finance Authority that was established by our board of commissioners, they are able to go ahead and float bond issues throughout Pennsylvania that help with, you know, uh, bonds for the county, municipal authorities, schools, and um, boroughs and towns. So I, I just think it's a matter of education or not education, I hate to use that term, informing, information. Absolutely. So my, my final question is really because of your experience on the ground, oftentimes these conversations get really siloed, you know, water, wastewater over here, broadband over here, transit over here. As a local, as someone at the local level and thinking about how do you interconnect all these pieces and the, the connection between economic prosperity and opportunity in your community, how do you make those connections or is it even possible to make those connections at the local level in, in a way that's effective? I think it is because I'm fortunate the gentleman who's head of the PA cyber school is someone that I've worked with before. And so we have a dialogue. My uh, chairman of my board also, he's involved, Dick is involved in a lot of organizations. So he is our best conduit for a lot of, you know, a lot of things. 
And I think if we can just keep the lines of communication open, and if there's a misunderstanding, try to uh, correct it right away so that you know you can you can stay on course. Well, thank you very much, Bridget, and thank you to everyone. I'm going to invite everyone to come back on the screen if possible. We've got some questions that have been submitted through the Q&A portal uh, for today. And the first of which uh, is going to go to Emily. Um, and Emily, I know you already answered this in some ways, but uh, there are a lot of questions about broadband and whether or not broadband uh, will be a part of the future surveys. Um, and so I didn't know if you want to speak at all about that in particular. Sure, I was frantically trying to answer some questions in case we didn't get to them. But um, yes, I meant to mention we did not include a full chapter with a grade on broadband, um, but we did what we call a spotlight on broadband in this edition of the report card. We tried to take a look at um, some of the issues around mapping. So when, you know, when it says an area is covered sufficiently, we know that the maps aren't accurate. Um, if there's one house in a census block that says they have coverage, then you get to count the whole block. And um, so we, we uncovered some of those issues. <laughs> and in general, to add a category to the report card, it has to be somewhere in the civil engineer's purview. So I saw another question about whether we're looking at physical infrastructure. We are, we're looking at where civil engineers have expertise, but in, as broadband, uh, has developed over the years. We do have a role in broadband infrastructure. There's even some intersections with um, electric grid and utility infrastructure and putting some of the 5G, um, attaching that to utility poles and that 5G infrastructure. So we're getting up to speed. We put together an initial analysis and I would expect to see more in future report cards. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Emily. Dave, there's a question that came up about uh, the big pot of funding coming for, for tribal communities, in particular around flooding and land loss and how to remove the causes of those, especially in, in the tribal connection. I don't know whether or not you have any thoughts or ideas behind that, but it was a, a particular question specific to indigenous uh, communities. And so I wanted to, to see if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, sorry, I didn't see that one pop up, but thanks for, for reading that out. Uh, yeah, flooding is an issue, right? I mean, our Army Corps of Engineers doesn't necessarily map tribal lands. So it's a big issue when tribes look to do development, they just don't have the data available to look at flood zones. Uh, in one case in the Navajo Nation, uh, they, they did it themselves and did the flyovers and were able to produce the 3D maps to, to be able to plan development. But most tribes don't have uh, the benefit of that. Um, so, uh, in addition to that, you know, you have sacred sites and areas that need to be addressed. Um, you know, the, uh, a joke that was told one time, uh, sitting around at the center for construction in any country, uh, there was a guy from, from, uh, Gila river and he was, uh, and he was saying, boy, you know, we really appreciate that, uh, um, you know, that, that our planning and zoning department is doing such a good job because, you know, at least we're not, uh, I won't even mention the tribe, at least we are X tribe, you know, they're back in the 1920s, but we sure would like to be where Salt River is, which, which is current, you know, they've got a very sophisticated uh, land use planning and zoning plan. And then the guy from Salt River spoke up, they said, you know, I looked at our land use planning and zoning documents, and they're actually city of Pasadena in 1998. So, you know, it's, it's just, we're, we're kind of catching up. We've got a lot of catch up to do. And uh, I think the use of these funds would be very wise to kind of look at land use planning and zoning and, uh, and, and flood zones. So, uh, so yeah, it, it's a big issue. Thank you very much. Alexander, one of the questions was relating to environmental justice issues when it comes to infrastructure. And obviously really vulnerable communities have long been uh, on the, the, the lower scale of, of access and affordability issues when it comes to, to infrastructure. From your experience working in the Delta, you know, are there ways that we should consider from a policy perspective of, of how do we better address the needs of, of those communities in particular? Well, yeah, I, I think it's important to go back and historically take a look at what the infrastructure investment has been in those communities versus uh, more affluent communities. And if we see the gaps there, then I think there's an obligation to at least address those issues and try to uh, make funding available if it's a, if it's at all possible. Um, that gets to be, while I think it's necessary, I think you also have to consider um, how do we fund it? Uh, it's, it's, it's often easy just to say we're going to give the money, but where does it come from and what's the 
what's the real investment there? So yeah, I, I think we have to look at that. Um, but finding a, a concrete solution, I think is a little bit more tricky. Yeah, thank you. So Bridget and Dave, another question came out, uh, actually a couple of questions I'm gonna craft into one of those. How do we make these kind of funding opportunities more accessible? How do we ensure that the communities that need these funds the most get access to them um, and create opportunities for them to, to better engage in the process? As, as far as I can see, I think we need to actually work with our legislators and talk to them because they don't always have the time to look at the issue, you know, dive deep into it. And I think if we can talk to them and explain to them that more money is needed to help us so that we can help their constituents as well, uh, I think that is a good, a good starting point. Um, and also talk to your talk to your like your county commissioners, and also to um, uh, your local uh, your local uh, government. Make sure everybody's on the same page. Yeah, and I, I would say kind of with seeing consistent with the theme of my presentation, it's all about relationships. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be part of a few um, seminars on specific funding. Uh, sources like LIHTC and New Market Tax Credits and others. And one of the things that comes out of those sessions, what we did, the way we organized it is that the tribe needs to apply, have to have a project uh, that they've got in their pipeline, even to apply to be part of the seminar. Then when they come to the seminar, we set them up in teams and we pair them with individuals from private sector and public sector agencies. And what comes out of it is really powerful, right? You roll up your sleeves, you develop some pro formas, you get into the meat of, you know, what the, the funding source requires and what comes out of it at the end. I mean, I think one of the comments that was made that was really beautiful was there was a woman from Hopi from the Hopi reservation. And she said, boy, you know, I was really intimidated by the low income housing tax credit program, but in our group was one of the underwriters from the Arizona light tech program. And we got to know each other. His son runs track, my son runs track. And now I know I could pick up the phone. And he said, anytime I, I have a question about, you know, the funding program or getting, uh, you know, getting through the process, I could, I could call him. And the guy said the same thing. He said, you know, I lived my whole life in Arizona. I've never been to the Hopi Reservation and come to find out they are a perfect match for the LIHTC program. Everything that I was told about their housing situation suggests that they would be a perfect candidate for a LIHTC program. And so now I know someone at, at the Hopi Reservation. So just that relationship within the context of the financing is incredibly important. And we just don't have enough of that going on. So I really encourage uh, opportunities to build some bridges and gain some technical knowledge and establish some strong relationships. Uh, that point right there, Dave, I don't think we could we could expand upon that anymore. I think you hit that perfectly. And I know Ferd Alexander talked about that in relationships with mayors and other local officials, Bridget, the same thing. It, that relationship is just so critical in and in continuing to build relationships even outside of your own community and your, your opportunities. So we've got about two minutes left. So I wanna ask each of you one more thing. And, and this is with this large scale infrastructure funding that, that's potentially coming through here in, in the near future, if you had one small victory or celebration that you would like to see happen, small, big, doesn't matter, what would be the one thing that you would wanna see happen out of this? Mine's easy. Use every single penny. Don't give one penny back to the federal government. Use it all. And do not ever give any of that money back. I'll, I'll go ahead. I mean, I would say, you know, focus on maintenance and some of the less glamorous things that communities need across the country um, is something that we want to make sure and we're happy to see in this bill. And I just want to foot stop what Bridget said also, this is not a done deal yet. So please, if you, you know, talk to your legislators now and tell them you want this bill. I mean, I was writing down what Dave said about 12 billion for tribal. I think there's some narrative here in DC that, oh, this isn't in here and that's not in there and it's not perfect. But, you know, I think they need to be hearing now that this is pretty darn good and, and we need this for our community. I just hope that there is an equitable way to divide this money up, not only between uh, or for the larger 
uh, concerns because believe me, I know some of the larger towns like or cities like Pittsburgh have multiple problems, but by the same token, so do those of us in rural Pennsylvania and so does all of rural America. We need that help to help us sustain our towns and our businesses. Um, I, I think I, I would really want to see a lot of the funding go uh, into rural America to address some of those critical needs for the small and rural communities. Um, Emily showed a slide earlier uh, of flooding near Vicksburg. That's been going on for quite a few years now. So there's a definite need there uh, to address those concerns as well. Well, thank you to everyone who joined us today. This conversation was fantastic. I'm sure we could have gone on for, for several other hours, uh, but really appreciate you joining us today for the great perspective that you provided. Uh, and now we're gonna to pivot to our breakout room. So everyone who registered should have gotten a link. If you have not, again, please contact csg.program at aspeninstitute.org. Uh, look forward to, to great conversations. You'll have one of these speakers that you've seen today as well as a facilitator in each room. But I wanna take just a quick moment to thank Emily, Dave, Alexander, and Bridget uh, for being with us today, but more importantly, for all the work that they're doing uh, throughout the year on, on infrastructure issues. So thank you all for joining us. I'm looking forward to seeing you all in the breakout rooms.